Welcome to section 19.6. All right, gentle people, today what we're going to talk about is crystal field theory or CFT. So this theory is going to help us explain some of the properties of our transition metal complexes, namely magnetism, energy, and color. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and think about our coordinative bond in a different way. Now, we're just going to do this so that we can explain these properties away. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our ligands and assume that these are negative point charges. So what I want you guys to do is that whole ligand, you are going to make it just a simple dot. And that dot is going to be a negatively charged species. Now, what we're going to do, instead of thinking these as dative bonds where the ligand is going to donate a pair of electrons, we're going to hyper exaggerate that donation. And we're going to think of these things as ionic bonds where my ligand is a negative point charge and my metal is that positive center. Now, to explain crystal field theory, what I need you guys to do is remember the d orbitals is real important that you remember the shapes of the d orbitals and their designations. So to help you guys out, here are the d orbitals pictured for you guys. Which I want you guys to remember is these labels tell you the shape of our d orbitals. Let's go ahead and take a look at these later three ones, the dyz, the dxy, and the dxz. So what you guys will notice is each one of these are clover shaped meaning you guys have lobes that are pointed like this. Now, what I want you to note is the YZ, the XY, and the XZ, the, these designations tell you where these lobes lie on or which plane those lobes lie on. Let's go ahead and establish our Cartesian coordinate axis. What I'm going to have is Z going up and down, Y going left and right, and then I'm going to have X going in and out of the page. With that in mind, let's go ahead and take a look at where these lobes reside on. Let's go ahead and focus in on DXY. What you guys will notice is the lobes of DXY reside in the XY plane. To help you guys out, let's go ahead and just look at the XY plane. So if this is my XY plane, the lobes of the DXY are between the axes. And the same can be said with the DYZ and the DXZ. The lobes of this one are going to be in the YZ plane, but between the axes. This one right here is going to be in the XZ plane, and the lobes are between the X axis and the Z axis. Now, when looking at the D orbitals, there are two very strange ones, and that's the ones with the squared term associated with them the dz squared and the dx squared minus y squared. Now the dx squared minus y squared is still going to be clover shaped. However, it's orientated in space a little bit differently. This one is actually on the axis itself. So if I were to go ahead and draw my y-x axis, I'm going to still have dx squared minus y squared in this plane, but the lobes of the clover are going to be along the axis itself, unlike what happens in dxy. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about the last d orbital, and that's the dz squared. This is the only one that is not a clover, and what you guys can see, it looks like a p orbital, where it looks like a dumbbell along the z axis, and what it has is a toroid or a donut around the center. Now that we've established what the d orbitals look like, let's go ahead and delve into crystal field theory. All right, so again, in crystal field theory, I'm going to have my metal in the center. And the first case that I'm going to look at is the octahedral arrangement of ligands. And so what that means is that I'm going to have six ligands come towards my metal center. One, two, three, four, five, and six. Now remember, these six ligands are going to be point charges. All my negativeness is in this single point, and I'm going to go ahead and bring that single negative charge towards that metal center. Now remember, that metal center has all these d orbitals, 
and these d orbitals are where electrons are going to reside. And so what you're going to have is the interaction between the negative electrons and the negative point charge. And this interaction is unfavorable. And what's going to happen is it's going to start to destabilize some of these d orbitals. Now, in the octahedral case, what we can see is that any time a negative point charge or a ligand is pointed directly at the orbital, it is going to destabilize that orbital greatly. So let's take a look at these two guys up here, the dz squared and the dx squared minus y squared. What you guys will see is there are ligands on the z axis. And again, that's exactly where my dz orbital is pointing. And so this destabilizes my dz squared. I have a negative interacting with a negative. For the dx squared minus y squared, if I look at the octahedral, four of my six ligands are pointed directly at that orbital. And so again, this is going to destabilize the x squared minus y squared. However, if we take a look at the dyz, xy, and xz, you'll notice that in my octahedral arrangement, none of the ligands are pointed directly at a lobe. You will see that in each picture, the ligand is between the lobe of each one of these orbitals. While they get close, they are not directly pointed at these orbitals. So in this case, the dyz, xy, and xz are destabilized, but not as much as these two guys up here. So let's take a look at this in an energy diagram. So the first thing we have is the free metal ion. So just as an example, let's say I have cobalt 2 plus. If I have just the bare metal without any ligands, what you guys will notice is the d orbitals are degenerate. And what I mean by that is all the d orbitals are at the same energy when there are no ligands present. Now, as I put ligands around my cobalt in an octahedral fashion, what will happen is I will start to destabilize all my d orbitals. And so all my d orbitals are raised in energy. I'm putting a negative next to a negative. Now, what's going to happen is some of these are destabilized more than others. It turns out that the dx squared minus y squared and the dz squared are destabilized more. That's because the ligands are pointed directly at the lobes of these orbitals. The other three orbitals are destabilized, but not as much. And so the result is I split my d orbitals. They are no longer the same energy. What I have is a group that's higher in energy and three that is lower in energy. And there's a difference in energy, and this is called the crystal field splitting energy. Now, this is going to depend on the ligand itself and the charge of the metal. So let's take a look at the ramifications of splitting my d orbitals. So again, here's my octahedral splitting, two up and three down. Now, what you guys will notice is my d orbitals will have electrons in it. So let's say that I have an electron in one of these bottom three. What can happen is that it can absorb light, and if it absorbs light, it absorbs energy. And if I absorb energy, well, what's going to happen is my electron is going to be promoted to a higher energy state. Now, this energy is the same energy that my d orbitals are split by. This is my crystal field splitting energy. Now, you guys can use that equation that we did in chapter 12, and we can see what type of lights are appropriate to make sure that this promotion occurs. What is interesting about this delta E is that this delta E corresponds to wavelengths in the visible region of light. And this is why transition metal complexes are colored.
So if you guys have taken a pottery class, you might have heard the term cobalt blue. And so if you wanted a blue dye, sometimes they will use cobalt. If you have these orange pots, that's usually due to the iron content in the dye or in the clay. If you guys look at stained glass windows, what they do is they put some transition metals in there to give them the various colors. And so when you look at these transition metal complexes, they are often colored because they are absorbing visible light. To delve into this a little bit further, let's go ahead and look at the artist's color wheel. Now to draw the artist's color wheel, what you, what you guys can do is remember the mnemonic device, Roy G. Biff. So to draw the artist's color wheel, you're gonna simply draw a circle, and you're gonna go ahead and cut your circle into six equal portions. Now just go ahead and write the letters of Roy G. Biv, the colors of the rainbow. And you can put indigo and violet together. So now what we have is the artist's color wheel. So let's go ahead and take a look at the properties of absorption and the appearance of the colors. So let's go ahead and draw our octahedral splitting. And so what we notice is that this energy right here corresponds to a wavelength of light. That wavelength of light is in the visible region. Let's go ahead and say that our absorbance here corresponds to red light. Now, if a substance absorbs red light, what you can do is you can employ the artist's color wheel you are going to look at its complementary color. Complementary colors are right across from each other. So in this case, red, the complementary color is green. And so what's going to happen is if something absorbs a certain color, it is going to appear the complementary color. So if my substance here absorbs red, it is going to look green to me when I go ahead and view it. And so the same can be said as you work yourself around that wheel. So if something goes ahead and absorbs yellow light, then it will appear violet to you. Now remember, one of the factors that affects the crystal field splitting energy is the ligand itself. So if I draw the octahedral case, this delta E is going to be dependent on the ligands. Some ligands are going to make this gap really big, and some ligands are going to make this gap really small. Now, the ones that make the gap really small are called weak field ligands. And the ones that are going to make the gap really big are called strong field ligands. Now, what chemists have done in the past is they have gone ahead and ranked each ligand in order. This is called the spectrochemical series. And so on one end, you will have the things that split very small. And on the other hand, you will have ligands that will make that splitting very large. I haven't decided if I want you guys to memorize this sequence or not. So ask me later if I will put the spectrochemical series on your information sheet. But let's go ahead and really show this one play out. So let's take a look at this series of chromium complexes. The first one is I have chromium with six fluorines attached to it. Now what you guys will notice on the previous slide is fluorine is a rather weak field ligand. So it's not going to split my d orbitals up that much. Let's go ahead and take a look at this fluorine complex. Let's say that the absorption of this fluorine complex is around 650 nanometers. This corresponds to red light. And so that means it absorbs red light, and so it'll appear its complementary color, and that turns out to be green. Now if I look at H2O, H2O is a stronger field ligand than fluorine. You guys can see it way down here. And so what that means is it's going to make that gap bigger. And so now you see a greater splitting. So that means that this complex is going to absorb higher energy light or shorter wavelength light. And so let's go ahead and say that this absorbs around 
575 nanometers. This corresponds to yellow, and because it absorbs yellow light, that means it's going to head and look purple to us. And then finally, we have ammonia as our ligand. Now, ammonia is an even bigger splitter than water. And so that means the splitting is going to go ahead and increase. That means the energy of light that this is going to absorb is going to be greater. And let's say that this one absorbs wavelengths around 415. This corresponds to an absorbance of purple light. So if it absorbs purple, it will look like its complementary color of yellow. So what I hope you guys can see is by changing the ligand, I change the delta E, the crystal field splitting energy, and by doing that, I, ch I change the energy of light that it can absorb. If I change the energy of light that I absorb, then I'm gonna change what color it's going to look to me. Now let's take a look at some other consequences of the crystal field splitting. And that is when I start filling in electrons. Now, traditionally, what I told you guys to do was, was to use the Aufbau principle. And the Aufbau principle stated that you always fill in the lowest energy levels first, pair them up before you start going to a higher energy level. Now we're going to see that we're going to break the Aufbau principle. And so let's look at the two competing factors. Let's draw my octahedral splitting with my delta E here. So let's go ahead and say that I have four electrons in my d orbital. So I'm going to say d4. Now the first three electrons you guys are going to put in normally and follow Aufbau's principle. So they go to the bottom orbitals. One, two, and three. Because they are degenerate, we're going to go ahead and spread them out. Now the question becomes what to do with that fourth electron. Now we have two choices. One is we can pair them up like we've always done. So this is going to be pairing my electrons. Now when I pair electrons, it is going to cost me energy. That's because I'm putting two electrons essentially in the same place. Now the other thing that I can do is I can put the fourth electron on the higher energy level. So both of these choices cost me energy. Now what happened in the past is we always said that moving to a higher energy level was more energy than the pairing energy. However, when we start looking at crystal field splitting, this energy is very much comparable to the pairing energy. So what happens is, if my delta E is really great, then you guys are going to do what you normally do. And that is, you are going to pair before you promote. However, if my delta E is very small, then what's going to happen is that it's going to take less energy for me to promote an electron than pair an electron. And if that is the case, then I'm going to promote before I pair. So what is important is the size of my crystal field splitting energy. Now, if my ligand is a strong field ligand, say something like cyanide, well, that's going to lead to a large delta E and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pair my electrons before I promote them. This is called the low spin case. Now, the reason it's called the low spin case is remember the spin of an electron is either plus one half if the arrow is pointing up or it is minus one half if the arrow is pointing down. So if I were to try to add up all the spins here, plus a half, minus a half, cancels each other out, plus a half, minus a half, plus a half, minus a half. So the total spin of this is zero. Now, if I have the weak field case, what you will have is a weak field ligand. So let's go ahead and say bromine is kind of a weak field ligand. That means my crystal field splitting energy is very small, and that means I'm going to go ahead and promote my electrons before I pair them up. 
And so this is going to result in the high spin case. So what you guys can see is that I went ahead and put these two electrons up here before I paired them. Now what I can do is I can add up the spins. Plus a half, minus a half, cancel each other out. And then I have plus one half, another half, another half, and another half. And so this has a total spin of two. I'm adding four plus one halves together. Now, there is no magic ligand that says this is the weak field ligand, this is the strong field ligand where the split happens up. What I want you guys to remember are these are questions where they're gonna ask you the relative chance for it to go high spin or low spin. So what I want you guys to do is take a look at these couple of quiz questions and answer them out, and then we'll go ahead and discuss them. So for our first question, what I'm asking you is to remember some vocabulary. And so what we have is our cyanide case and our bromine case. One is going to be our low spin case, one is going to be our high spin case. And remember what the word diamagnetic means. Diamagnetic means that all my electrons are paired. So in this case, you'll see that if I look at my low spin case, all my electrons are paired up. However, in my high spin case, I have unpaired electrons. So this one is going to be paramagnetic, and the one that is diamagnetic is going to be choice number A. Hopefully what you can see is that magnetic properties can be predicted by which ligand I have and how much it splits my d orbitals. So what we need to do is we need to go ahead and get the electronic configuration of chromium. So let's go ahead and write this out. So chromium is going to have an uh, argon core. It's 4s1, 3d5. Chromium's this unique case where it gets that half-filled s orbital. So in this case, I want to go ahead and find what chromium 3 plus is. So I'm going to go ahead and remove three electrons. So I'm going to still have my argon core, and I'm going to remove my first electron, and then I'm going to remove two electrons from my, from my D manifold. And so this becomes 3D3. So I have trisethylene diamine. Ethylene diamine is a bidentate ligand, so that means that this is coordination number six. If it's coordination number six, I have an octahedral geometry. So let's go ahead and draw our octahedral splitting. Two up and three below. Now in this case, we don't know the size of our delta E, but in this case, it doesn't matter. What you guys will notice is I have to fill in 3D electrons. So one, two, three in my D orbital splitting diagram. So in this case, it didn't matter the size of delta E because I never came to that crossroad of promotion or pair. This will always have three electrons on the bottom. So the next thing we can do is we can look at other geometries. We've discussed the octahedral splitting case. Let's go ahead and look at our tetrahedral case. So again, we're going to do the same treatment. We're going to go ahead and look at our d orbitals. And this time, we are going to bring in our point charges, our ligands, and we're going to bring it in on a tetrahedral geometry. Now, this is a little difficult to envision. What you guys can try is imagine that a tetrahedron is inside of a cube. And each one of the ligands are on a corner of the cube. Now, it's only going to be four out of the eight corners of that cube. So here's the picture of the ligands arranged in space. Now what you guys can notice is how they interact with the d orbitals. Now remember, if a lobe is pointed directly at a ligand, then that is a very unfavorable interaction. Now what you guys will notice is none of the lobes are pointed directly towards a ligand. So the first thing we'll note is in the tetrahedral case, the splitting is going to be much, much smaller. Nothing is super destabilized. Now, it's kind of tough to tell, but these bottom three get slightly closer to the ligands than these top two. 
And so what that means is these bottom three are destabilized more than the dz squared and the dx squared minus y squared. So this right here is the tetrahedral crystal field splitting diagram. What you guys will notice is it's the exact opposite of the octahedral. The dx squared minus y squared, the dz squared are on the bottom, and the dxc, the dxy, and the dyz are up on top. Now because the ligands weren't directly pointed towards one of those d orbitals, what you will notice is the delta e for the tetrahedral case is always going to be smaller than the octahedral. In other words, what you guys can say is the splitting is always going to be weak and small. So every ligand in the tetrahedral scenario is going to be considered a weak field ligand. So just to give you guys an example, here's chromium with four waters attached to it. So chromium has a two plus charge, and let's go ahead and look at its electron configuration. So again, chromium zero, argon core, 4s1, 3d5. So if I have chromium two plus, I'm gonna have my argon core, I'm gonna remove one electron from the s orbital first, and then I'm gonna go ahead and take that last electron from the d orbitals. So I'm left with 3d4, so I have four electrons to place in the tetrahedral diagram. So I'm gonna go ahead and remember that this splitting is very small, so that means I am going to promote before I pair. So the first electron, the second electron, and then promotion, three, and finally four. This means that tetrahedral complexes are always going to be high spin. Now the last D-splitting diagram that I want you guys to know is the one for square planar. And this one's a bit tricky, uh, but you can rationalize this from starting with the octahedral complex. What you guys will notice is that if I look at an octahedral complex and I were to suddenly remove the two things on the z-axis, well then I would get a square planar complex. And so this is what this diagram is trying to show you. If I go ahead and try to take away this ligand and this ligand from the z-axis, what's going to happen is I'm going to stabilize anything with the z component. So what that means is dz squared, it had a ligand pointing towards it, and now if I remove that ligand from the z-axis, you'll see that that goes down in energy. That's because I'm not destabilizing that orbital anymore. And you can see that this happens with anything with a Z component to it. They all go down in energy. Now, as you remove these two ligands, what tends to happen is the four other ligands start to go in closer. So what I mean by that is the ligands on the X axis and the Y axis they all start hugging towards that center a little bit more. And so remember, if I'm bringing those ligands closer, anything with an XY component is suddenly going to raise up in energy. And so that's why you'll see X squared minus Y squared go up in energy because it's directly pointed at the ligands. And then you'll also see the XY suddenly goes up in energy. And at the end, you have what is the D-splitting for square planar complex. You'll notice that you have dx squared minus y squared up top, then it goes dxy, dz squared, and then the dxz and the dyz. When you guys fill electrons with this splitting diagram, I want you guys to understand that these four orbitals on the bottom are very close in energy. So you wanna promote electrons up into the dxy before you start pairing them up. The dx squared minus y squared is the last orbital that you wanna to try to put electrons into. Well, I hope that made sense, Chem1c, and remember to stay safe.